Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is March 21st, 2016, and my guest is Gary Belsky, founding partner of the consulting firm Ellen Road Partners, former editor-in-chief of ESPN the magazine, and author with Neil Fine of numerous books, the latest being On the Origins of Sports, the Early History and Original Rules of Everybody's Favorite Games. Gary, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's a pleasure. So this is a really entertaining book. Um it covers a lot of things, a lot of sports and a lot of aspects of sports that people don't know about. It's amusing, and you learn a lot along the way. It also includes some things that some people won't call, wouldn't call sports, which we'll get to later. But I'm going to start with a very basic question, which is, uh, which sport started with the thickest rule book, and which sport do you think has the thickest one now? That's an interesting question. I suspect... I don't think any of them started with rule books, at least any of the sports that we covered, but I did think some of them started with rules that were written down. Um, And I think it was probably the rules of cricket or the rules of of the football association, uh, a.k.a. soccer in America, or oddly enough, the rules for ultimate, which people think of as ultimate Frisbee, which are the most recent rules for the most part in our book. Um, and they were written in the late 1960s or 1970 uh, by a high school kid in New Jersey. And he already had a lot of other sets of rules to look at and imagine what rules of a new sport should be like. And those rules are probably, you know, technically if you did a word count, they would, have, they would be the longest of the ultimate rules. How about now in current uh, sports? Do you know offhand which well, – I'll just – I mean, the two major sports that I think of as having tons of rules are football and baseball. Yeah, when we did, um, when I was at ESPN the magazine, we actually did a. At some point, we at, we asked and answered this very question, um, and we did like a little graphic uh, for it on the back page of the magazine. We had something for a while called um, "And Another Thing." It was the last thing in the in the magazine, and we did a sort of rule book comparison. I think I believe it's either like. Formula One or um, the NFL, pretty sure. The NFL, you know, uh, we make the point, as, as I think you know in the book, that the you know eat, many sports reflect their national character. And the NFL from the beginning um, was, or, or football, I should say, from the beginning was an extraordinarily detailed and uh, nuanced, if that's the word, or obsessive uh, set of rules. Any thoughts on on why that is? Especially, I mean, there, baseball has become an American game, it's, and it has lots of rules. By the way, it's not like it doesn't have very many. They're just sort of complicated and hard to remember. Football seems to be evolving every year. I I have a theory, um, if you'd like to hear it, and the theory has to do with the. It, it, it's similar to why I think football is such a has become such a popular sport in America, which is, you know, it's an entertaining sport, but there's a lot of them that are, but there's a, there's an aspect of scarcity to football, right? No matter how many games we have, no matter how many college football games or professional football games, there's still just not as many football games as there are most other sports games. And so that's one of the reasons I think, and that a lot of other people think that football has achieved its, its um, kind of rarefied altitude in in the American sports landscape is that it's, um, you know, there's just not as much of it, no matter how much we think there is now versus what there was 30 years ago. You mean in a particular season? In a particular season, right. There's 16 games as opposed to 160 games, right? And so I think there's a, I think there's something to that when it comes to the actual each moment of play in football. I just think there's, um, there are fewer actual moments of activity. And so they all end up taking on a higher level of importance. And th- therefore, there's much more likely, the, uh, a much more likely outcome is that any individual aspect of those rare plays will make people um, nit- and nitpick about them. The reason I say that, by the way, is actually from personal experience, which is that, so 
uh, I am a, you know, I'm 54, but I continue to play lots of sports regularly, N- not necessarily well, but enthusiastically. You know, I play regularly softball and basketball and sometimes even hockey and, and football in a, in a pretty competitive uh leagues in all those cases. And only in our football leagues do we have the kinds of arguments that if I was watching a videotape of myself, I would be embarrassed to be participating in, <laughs> where people are arguing about whether or not somebody was out of bounds or whether or not somebody jumped off sides or was there holding or, you know, was there illegal motion or whatever, you know, pass interference, whatever the case may be. And it's astounding to me because I, I, I play, by the way, with lots of other grownups. Um, and everybody or m- many of the people who play are prone to this and in any other aspect of their life and in any other sport uh, that they play, they're not as argumentative. And I think it's because every play in our s- silly Sunday morning football leagues feels much more significant because they are relative to, you know, the uh, any given basketball play or baseball at bat, et cetera. I think it, so I think in general, the reason why football is so, um, is so argumentative is not because of the violence of the sport, but rather because there are all these st- start and stop moments, you know, reset essentially, and they all feel like they're more important than, of course, they really are. I guess there's also, you know, the play itself is very distinctive. Now, there, there's certain things you could call plays in other sports, a pitch in baseball or a possession in basketball, but there's also something a little more concentrated about a, ba- a baseball, uh, excuse me, a football play. It would be as if uh, an outlet pass in basketball was this. Okay, we could just never be as significant. Whereas, uh, if you if, in football, of course, as you point out, it is. I want to raise a different question, which is. By the way, you're right because there's you know roughly give or take about 120 plays in a typical football game, and by any other by any measure, however you measure those other plays in those other sports, possessions or at bats or even pitches, there's countless more. So again, it's a, it's that it's the import brought on the sense of import brought on by scarcity. I think. I don't know. I, I wonder if there's more to it. I, I I'm struck by the fact. You know, you said it. This reflects the American character. The, the American character is pretty varied, as 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 anyone would would conclude. And it's hard to pin such a thing down. It's a bit of a in a way, it's a cliche, but. We do seem to be a somewhat litigious nation uh, <laughs> prone to lawsuits, and we're also very – we care a lot about fairness. And And I'm struck in recent years by how obsessed sports fans are in every sport, football being just one dramatic example, but we're in the middle of the NCAA tournament. And it too has gotten more careful about being accurate. Uh, every sport has that has a lot of money in, at stake and also I think a lot of fans at stake. And why is that? Why is it that 20 years ago we just said, well, you know, easy come, easy go. That's the breaks. Those are the breaks. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So, life's not fair. In sports, we don't say that. We increasingly never say it. Yeah, well, I think I think part of it has to do with the fact that we think we, because of technology, we think we understand more of what's going on in any individual play. So we think because we have more information that we therefore are closer to approximating some sort of truth. And I think everybody in general, one, you know, it's just a human nature or some, or one aspect of human nature to sort of want some idealized, you know, truth or beauty in, in perfection. And of, of course, you and I have talked before, I, I think the more information you have, doesn't necessarily mean you're any closer to having any kind of truth. But I think um, I think the other reason is that the is that sports continues to occupy such a prevalent place in our society, in our you know writ large, and also in our individual minds, because there's some kind of modeling going on. There's the, the there it, it, it's the athletes are exemplars. The games are meant as you know, or, or non-consciously we see them as ways in which the world can be meritocracies or put in order where effort and intelligence and teamwork and cohesion come together. And we think that that's, at least in Western, I think in, you know, Western cultures, we think that those combinations should lead to some sort of absolute certainty about outcome or, or reward. And, and if sports are serving that purpose for us, then it makes sense to me that we would always be striving for this idea of, it should, you know, this should be what we're aspiring to. We should always be trying to have the outcome reflect, you know, what all the inputs uh, on both sides. So I, I think it, I think it just may be that that we think of sports as something that's supposed to 
guide us or be some kind of beacon on a hill about how humans are supposed to interact and compete and and win with grace and lose with you know dignity, et cetera. That's a great answer, right? And it might be true. Uh, and, yeah, you know, I, even better. I, yeah, <laughs> By the way, I, I realized something. You know, you were asking me what sport when it started had the longest rule book. Um, in our book, I would argue that the, the two sports that have the longest pages devoted to the actual rules, as you know, we reproduce the rules of the original, what we identified as the original rules or the, of the modern games for every sport. Football and bowling are actually the, the longest. We can talk about bowling in a second, but football is the longest. But those rules were already were, – they were about 35 years into what you might think of as organized football as we know it. But the, and so the, the game – of football rules that we said were the modern first rules were being built on top of a set of rules that already existed. The reason why we chose those rules, which were published in 1906 was because they um, were in the, it was, it saw the institution officially of the forward pass. So, and the forward pass is really what created the modern game of football. But, but you know, when I was answering your question, um, thinking about just sort of the first set of written down rules that anybody, you know, could lay their hands on. And, and I think the longest of those were probably cricket or, um, or soccer, but in our book, it's, it's football and, and bowling, oddly enough. <laughs> yeah, that is odd. We're going to come back to bowling and I hope cricket, but I want to come back to your point about aspiration and meritocracy and fairness. And I do think we have a certain, uh, Aspiration is, is the right word, idealized, in other word, vision of what life could be like. And so we like to create that in some artificial way in our sports. And when it doesn't live up to that, it bothers us. Now, ironically, we, we still root for underdogs. We don't always want the, quote, best team to win or the team that would win if they played 100 times. We love, you know, the random element in sports. But we don't want the random element to come from the rules or the judges, the umpires, the refs, I think, is part of it. And at the same time... You know, the dark side of that. Well, we do and we don't, by the way, but yeah, finish your question and then no, I'll – Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll come back. Oh, well, I, you know, I think it, depending on the sport, we think um, – we often reward or at least are slightly amused by or whatever the case may be for athletes who play officials or play referees well, right? You know, in baseball, a catcher who frames a pitch that yeah. was out of the strike zone and somehow convinces the umpire that it was in the strike zone, nobody ever um, – sort of thinks that that catcher is doing something wrong. We, and we, in fact, we admire the great ones, whether or not it's Yogi Berra or Yadier Molina, or, and I'm sure there are other catchers who didn't either grow up in St. Louis or play for the St. Louis Cardinals, but uh, I don't really know much about them. About, yeah. um, but, you know, we, 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 think they're, we think they're devilish. And, you know, a, a, a veteran who can kind of manipulate a referee in basketball to get a, a call at a particular moment, we don't think of that, you know, we don't, disapprove of that. We kind of admire it. But That's a good point. on the other hand, we definitely do respond to certain kinds of cheating and certain kinds of, you know, getting past the rules or fooling referees as something other than admirable. So it's, it's a weird mix. And in, uh, in my opinion, so I'm going to ask a totally unrelated question. Then I'm going to come back to my point about aspiration and idealism, because I don't want to lose the, either of them. Um, okay. And we may disagree on this. I, I know you're a much bigger hockey fan than I am. Yes. I don't, I don't know about Soccer. I, I've I've become an increasingly interested soccer fan over the years. I played soccer in high school. I never played hockey. I didn't like the fighting in hockey, so I have a certain biases against against the sport, perhaps. But I find it very frustrating in soccer and hockey that a team can dominate the game and not win because of the size of the goal. That is, you can dominate possession. You can dominate um, skill. Uh, you can have the best shots, but a great goalie uh, can can win the game for a team, or just bad luck. A ball, it just the goals are small, and and that can happen in other sports. In football, well, in know, hockey, the goals are small. In soccer, they're not small. Well, they're small relative to the nature of playing things. field. Yeah, that's and, a great question. I have no idea how that yeah, but, actually shapes but, up. But put that to the side. You know, in football, in football, you can run up and down the field and turnovers and bad luck and you fumble and. Uh, you can settle for a field goal and you can get frustrated in the course of a day and the quote best team might not win the team certainly the team with the most yards doesn't always win but it seems to be that in soccer and hockey it's very often the case that the best team doesn't win and that i find that difficult uh other people probably think it's a feature not a bug what, what do you think 
Well, I think we're going to disagree, but on a different point, which is that I'm, I'm pretty certain, I don't have the data in front of me, but I'm pretty certain that in most of the sports that we're talking about, and definitely in soccer and hockey, the best teams, that, what your, your premise um, doesn't stand, that the teams that control possession and that have the most passes on target, which is definitely something they're tracking now in yeah. soccer, both those things, and, and increasingly in hockey as well, those teams generally do win. Um, that ultimately there is a strong correlation between dominance and um, between dominance of play and and outcome. I can't swear to it, but m- my no, recollection is that's have- true. No, I think that's true on average. And I think I think it's very hard to have be a champion if if you're not the best team. But it's it's striking to me on any one night in any one quarter, a team in hockey can press and press. In fact, you can have more players on the field than the other team. <laughs> you can have two extra players. You can. A team in hockey can be shorthanded by two players and still not give up a goal because of the difficulty, the very difficulty in scoring. And that's led some people say we should make the goals bigger. And I think some people mistakenly conclude that's that's a good idea because we need, quote, more scoring. I don't think we need more scoring. I think we need more accurate reflection of the outcome of the play. But again, maybe I'm wrong. Well, it's interesting. And I, I, I mean – I think I do disagree with you because I do think ultimately it's a the the most sports end up being fairly meritorious if that's a word or merit you know they they merit ends up for the most part Triumphing. winning out yeah. at the and you you're not you're not wrong that at the certainly at the highest levels there's not that much of a difference between the the top few teams and therefore I think there's a there's there are random outcomes that make what may be the best team only finish third or second or fourth but I generally don't think that the that you know, really weak teams ever end up, um, you know, winning well, major sure. things. But um, it again, I kind of think it's it's kind of like life to me, which is that, you know, I think that there's, you know, sometimes a few things. Even when you have great opportunities, like five on three in hockey, for example, um, you you know, a, a, a surfeit of 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 riches still has to be navigated and managed well. And oftentimes, what happens when teams have you know, a player advantage, um, especially in hockey, not, it doesn't make quite as much of a difference in, in soccer, but when, when teams have a player advantage or, or two player advantage in hockey, they end up kind of relaxing and they almost get smug about their ability or they conversely, they get so tight that, and they, they, they press score, so much yeah. because they feel they should. And to a great extent, I feel like that's kind of, you know, can happen in, you know, you can find analogs in life about that, about, you know, what to do when you're faced with those moments in which, you know, the door is wide open and somehow we freeze or we get nervous or whatever the case may be. And you don't want to take these metaphors too far because they just start to sound hokey. But uh, I, I think, again, the reason why sports, even when they have those kinds of outcomes, continue to enchant is because there's some sort of non-conscious recognition that like, yeah, this is... You know, that's kind of how life is. You and I have played golf together and even golf, which is a solitary sport, just more than any other physical activity I have. It sort of points out my strengths and weaknesses as a human being. Um, and no I think comment, that that's all. No comment. <laughs> and I think that's often true, you know, when we're either playing team sports or, or watching them be played and that that kind of randomness um, sort of and the and the opportunity you know missed opportunities and overcome obstacles feels like it has some relevance to our everyday life the the other thing I, I thought you were steering towards at one point in this conversation was it's interesting that um you know sports as metaphor for life like there's even especially in leagues um this concern about uh you know wealth distribution right um there's you know there's the the NFL more than anything is strives towards socialism. Um, and Correct. historically, That's for example, baseball, right. And historically baseball, less so now they're actually, you know, Correct. they've tried to fix this too. This idea that you had these sort of, you know, haves and have nots. And it's interesting. I've never seen anybody quite take a look at it. You know, I'd, I'd love to see you write about this because, um, I don't know whether or not conservatives in general tend to care more or less about that or people who are not, not even conservatives, people who are more against forced, you know, in wealth redistribution, what they're, you know, if they, if they prefer sports situations in which four or five teams consistently dominate and four or five teams are always in the bottom or not, I, I actually don't know, but it's an interesting thing to think about that I've never quite thought about that, you well, know, that's a, that's, that aspect of it. Yeah, that's a lot to think about it. And that would disturb me from, that might distract me from my other two questions and I'm going to try to okay. keep those and I'm going to come back to that. So if I forget, you're going to help me. But first I want to say that, you know, 
when I shoot a 77 and you shoot a 117, of course it's hard for you, Gary. I mean, you got to go with that. <laughs> and thank, thank goodness there are no video cameras in any of the courses we played on. Uh, <laughs> you have the you have the hand on the studio control, so I'm going to simply <laughs> just you know nod and smile at you. There you go. That's right. Uh, I've never met Mr. Mulligan. Actually, I'm not – Mulligan is not my problem. It's it's the ones that count. Um, second thing I was going to say is that uh, what I find interesting about the – coming back to your point about aspiration and the accuracy and the idealized fairness and meritocracy is that I, I don't teach in the classroom anymore. But when I did teach in the classroom, one of the things that used to drive me crazy was – students' obsession with getting an accurate grade on their homework. And they basically wanted instant replay. They wanted a review. They wanted to say this wasn't graded fairly. And, of course, they were often right. Uh, and I would tell them, you know, it's 10 percent of the grade. There are many, many homeworks. Any one question is not decisive. I give you a grade based on your homework and then without your homework, and I give you the one that's higher and – there are going to be times when you got graded unfairly in your own advantage and you're not going to come back to it. So I don't regrade homeworks. I regraded exams, which were much more important in the percentage of the grade, but I wouldn't regrade a homework and they would it would drive some students crazy. It's like saying, well, we can review this, but we're not going to. And I think I don't know whether those are the same phenomena, a phenomenon that's, that's gotten more common, that people are, really want fairness or whether it's just part of the human condition. And now that we have technology to let people do that in sports, of course they want to review. And of course they want to regrade if it's possible. And it's just part of human nature to want to be treated fairly. And for me to assure students, say, hey, look, it's going to turn out fine. Don't worry. It's not that comforting. And they, they weren't comforted. And I understood why. But I also told them if I regraded every homework that was people wanted to regrade, I'd spend most of my time regrading homeworks and not much time preparing a lecture. So they're trade-offs. But um, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, a lot of thoughts. As you know, I, I sometimes teach at NYU. I teach journalism. And so like like a lot of aspects of economics, um, the, especially the writing aspects of it, there's a lot of, you know, there it's it's somewhat of a soft uh, skill, right? And, and, you know, I think this is probably less of a problem. I don't know because I've never taught, you know, calculus or, you know, physics or biology where I think there are mostly right or wrong answers. But I think in the soft skills, there's a lot of variability based on, you know, who's receiving what you're producing. And I would tell my students all the time, I told them a couple of things. One was, so first of all, I think they are of a piece. I think it's about the same thing with people are striving towards some ideal, but and independent of kind of competitiveness and anxiety about careers and yeah. GPA. I think people are often sort of want to know that they're, you know, approaching some sort of idealized perfection or at least a high level of competency. And I always told my students, it's like, there's a lot about you know, about this that's similar to the to your career, which is you could write a story and turn it into an editor or even a group of editors on one day and they'll receive it as very strong and on another day they won't. And you sort of have to know how to deal with the consequences of that and also recognize that good teachers and good editors understand a little bit about their mood and sometimes they'll stop grading because they know they're in a bad mood or they'll <laughs> come back to something or they will, you know, look at it again. But that's a hard thing for it's definitely a hard thing for college students or even graduate students to understand, I think, because increasingly we've convinced ourselves that, you know, with data and technology and, um, you know, the kind of comparables that the Internet can provide, et cetera, that there is some sort of, um, you know, absolute truth in a, 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 a college level newspaper story or a college level economics paper or essay, whatever the case may be. Um, and I think that, you know, it's an admirable pursuit, but it doesn't really help students if they don't understand broadly that life gives you variability in uh, response to the very same work product. Yeah. And God, that is such a valuable lesson if you <laughs> understand that. And also, you know, you were, I'm certain, a much better student than I was in college. I was, a, you know, at best, a sort of a just a solid B student. It's like with, golf, you know, Gary. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> with a lot of undeveloped potential, I think, is how my, some of my professors would have <laughs> described it. But, um, but it's funny because when I see, you know, when we hire uh, at my our firm, uh, and it's, you know, we do um, a whole bunch of different things, but they're mostly soft skills. Like whenever I see people with perfect GPAs, I don't even really look at GPAs ever. But if it somehow comes up, I, I, I find I have less to talk about than because it's, I, I can't really ask people what was the thing that was most difficult for them when they have a 4.0 because yeah, they somehow managed to do everything well. 
and it's, you know, my, my, my most valuable lessons or my best stories or the things that are most revealing about myself, if, if I would be interviewed by somebody for a job, would be the things that I struggled with and how I managed that struggle and, you know, what I did with that and how it affected, you know, my course, my, my chosen path, et cetera. So, you know, I, I like, you know, the, we, we, we named the book on the origins of sports as kind of a nod to Charles Darwin. And, and Darwin, of course, talked a lot about variation of species, right, and variation within species. Um, and that to me, variation is, is kind of the, the interesting thing about life for me. Um, but like, I, I'm, I'm not interested in some sort of, um, you know, achieving any kind of absolute truth in any of most of the things that I do, because most of the things that I do are kind of soft and, you know, dependent on so many factors that are not, that don't stay the same. I think you're a little bit like me. Um, you're a humanist, but you're also really interested in data and facts yeah. and evidence. So it's not like everything's fine no matter what. You, you do care about reality and truth, uh, but you also are willing to give some credence to the uh, softer side of life, which I do, I do as well. Um, but well, I also think, you know, the, the, the most of the economics that I know I learned from you, um, but also, you know, of late, the thing that I find myself repeating most often and actually crediting you is just this idea of, and you definitely see it now more than ever, and you're made aware of it now more than ever because everybody yells everything with such certainty is just, and this is probably a function of just aging, but just how little we know for sure yeah. and how little even when we think we know something for sure, we, you know, there's not even necessarily a high level of confidence that it won't change at least to some extent moving forward. And I actually find that kind of beautiful and it makes me a more sympathetic human being and a more nuanced arguer or rhetorician, but it's a hard thing to communicate to people now because everybody else seems to think, or most people seem to think that we're, we know more than we ever knew. Yeah, and, right. you know, <laughs> we figured my it goodness. out. We figured it out. It's easy because we got the data. Um, I, I want to stick with this question I, I don't know if we'll get back to your socialism question but uh and redistribution question but i i want to stick with this question of accuracy because you can't help but notice again if if you're watching the ncaa tournament these days and you see it in football it's coming in baseball uh, it's already coming in baseball with replay the amount of time in the in the game itself that's devoted to trying to figure out what happened <laughs> Uh, yeah. that, that the game flow is, you know, football is incredible, right? Football has uh, almost no action anyway, right, to start with. And then we add on top of it referee conferences. Something like nine minutes in an hour. Yeah. Uh, but the other sports, basketball, basketball's broken up a lot already increasingly by fouls. But now it's not just fouls. It's fouls and they go courtside. They look at the at the replay monitor. They're doing this a lot more in professional. They're doing basketball. And, and at a certain level, you applaud it because you say, well, we want to get it right. At the other level, it's like, gosh, the game is so broken up now. Do you, is there a trade-off there? Is, there, is it ever going to be reached, the, the other side of it? Are people going to eventually say, uh, I mean, where is this going to end? Well, I mean, the one thing I will say to that, because uh, I experience it, as much as anybody else. But the fact of the matter is that while games are longer now, they're not 10 times longer than they used to be. Right. So I think, so I think to some extent, um, we, uh, we experience some of this because they, these moments, you know, it's the availability heuristic, right? Like the things that are, that stand out the most are the things we sort of think are more common than they are. So as much as football games are longer now than they used to be, or baseball games are longer now than they used to be, they're not five times as long. Yeah, they're true. 20% longer or 15% it's, longer, it's or, really you know, an, depending. Really, but I'm making an aesthetic point. It's not about how long the whole episode takes. No, no, I get takes. it. It's, um, you know, I, I have to say that for the, it, I think it depends on the, my experiences. I mean, all these experiences are subjective. Like, I don't mind it in in football or in baseball um, because I'm interested in those sports. I'm interested in these sort of like pivotal moments. You know, baseball is often right around a kind of did the home run? Was it a home run or a Very double? Foul. Was it yeah. was there tag made, et cetera? You know, the, the one of the most one of the most uh, amazing things to watch is the whole phantom tag thing on a double play, right? Which is that even now still happens more than you would think. That like as a as a entire um, community. There's somehow this like acknowledgement that there's a certain kind of non-tag tag of second base that is okay um, in baseball and and peop and everybody seem even though it could be fixed with replay nobody seems to want to so um, I'm just I, I think it 
I think it has to do with kind of like one's level of investment in the nuances of a given sport. What I mean by that is, first of all, there's very little of that in hockey with the exception of goals. There's very little of that in hockey that it's the only thing in hockey basically that people examine, like did it cross the line or not? And again, I think that sort of feels like interesting to people and I don't mind it as an aesthetic thing. I find it's it kind interesting, of important. but it's not like, was right. there interference on the, did he, did he make, have possession of that play at midfield? It's different. Right. And it, where, um, and in, in basketball, it, it just ends up to me, it, the whole thing ends up feeling very disequilibriumatic and, and choppy and, it's not even so much replay, but it's about kind of all the fouling and stuff like that, that, that is, is about a technical leverage of a rule that feels to me, um, to sort of spoil kind of the flow of what, you know, I used to think of as ballet and now seems less so. Um, and so I don't, I don't know if I have an answer that it, for me, it's, it just sort of goes sport to sport, but in the, for the most part, I don't mind it because my, that inner part of my brain that does want us to get it right for the most part says like, I'm, you know, if I'm going to give you three hours for a game, I'm willing to give you three and a half if it's going to make the game better. And, you know, what, what's interesting is that where I used to be able to watch baseball at length during the regular season for a whole game or even in person or on TV, I find that m much harder to do now. And it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that if it's a three hour oh, game, it wasn't sure. like Yep, if it was an hour and a half game, maybe I'd like it, but the, the, you know, but I think that just must be a function of me and the world, you know, yes. and there's just some game in the middle of April while it's interesting if I'm there and hanging out with kids or with it's friends. The Cardinals, yeah. Right. The game itself though, is not that interesting. Right. Yep. That's right. Um, I think that's true uh, for me as well. Uh, I was just going to make a comment on the phantom play at phantom tag at second base. I think that's a safety reason. I think, you know, there are a lot of norms in sports. We're going to talk about them in a minute. But one of the norms in sports is that on a double play, you don't have to touch second base with your foot. You just have to get close to it. And I think the reason that norm is maintained even in the face of replay is that it, you, you don't want a shortstop to be hurt um, making the pivot to, or a second sure. baseman. And I think that's there's a there's no easy way to fix that except to say, well, he's close enough. Um, well, you could draw. You could. By the way, there is. You could draw. A you could draw a little it. circle around yeah, the base, and then true. by the way, then you'd start having replay questions of was. <laughs> then it'd be like football, right? No, no. And then well, that's three seconds. And it's interesting. Rule, it's basically. interesting that we don't do that. Yep, no, that's true. Yeah. Um, if you could change one rule, or two or three in sports, are there any rules that you hate particularly as a sports fan or as a student of the game? Um. Yeah. There's probably a. There's. There's. I would change one habit. And probably two rules. In one, I think I know exactly how it changed. The other one, I don't know, but I'm looking for a fix. But the habit I would change is, um, and I feel like it it may come very soon. And if it doesn't, it should. Which is, um, we should eliminate helmets from football except during football games themselves. Um, I think yeah. if players from the beginning of their time in Pop Warner are not allowed to practice with helmets, they will quickly develop better tackling strategies that will involve their shoulders and their arms, et cetera. And helmets in games, it's not that they won't be used as much as they are now, but they will become more safety devices as opposed to Weapons. Uh, armor. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, you know, there's nothing, it, it's, it's one of those classic cases of, you know, accretion and unintended consequences. But uh, in the book, we, after each chapter, we do this, you know, we kind of take a little walk about something related to that particular sport. And in football, we do an evolution of the football helmet. And we make the observation that, you know, the football helmet was initially put in place, no pun intended, to protect players. And over time, it became so good at protecting players, the players became reckless. It's the exact same psychology that... Effect. Say it again? It's the Peltzman effect is what it gets called. Oh. Uh, named after Sam Peltzman, uh, and who was an econ talk guest talking about that. I'll put a link up to it. Some people dispute how widespread that is, how – you know, it's it's a it's another way of saying moral hazard, right? When things are relatively safe for you, you don't take account of the risk so much. Right. You know, you were the, you were the person that made the observation to me a long time ago that there's a very easy way to – um, to lower auto fatalities, which was by putting a giant metal spike in steering wheels. Uh, because if you put a giant metal spike in steering wheels, people really would drive much slower. Yeah. I think, <laughs> um, I, but anyway, I, I so I would that change was my idea here. I have to say that it gets attributed to Gordon Tullock, but it may have been independently developed by lots of economists. Cause it is something you would think about if you were 
worried about airbags uh, being dangerous, which, of course, they have been at various times. Yeah, and I, right. I, I, you know, as I understand it, I've read a little bit about this. The If you're going to get into a car accident, you want to be in a very large car, but you don't want to be in a very large car if you don't want to get into car accidents because – People who drive smaller cars that they perceive as less safe are much more careful drivers than yeah. people who drive SUVs. Yeah. So I think it's all sort yeah. of a piece. But I would change that. You know, I would I would get us as a as a as a world out of the habit of practicing um, skills on the football field with our helmets on because most people would become much better and more um, textbook tacklers if they uh, were only able to use their shoulders and their arms, and more importantly, if they didn't have to worry about the consequences to their noggin. Yep. So that's a habit I would change. Uh, the two rules I would change, the one that I know is I am on the side of uh, righteousness is I would don't uh, say, eliminate. Don't say designated here, Gary. I would eliminate the 40-year, 43-year tragedy that is the designated <laughs> hitter. Um, I don't even think I need to talk about that. No, it just seems not, patently obvious yes. as to why you would want to no, have everybody except for a pinch hitter have to play the field in order to earn the right to be uh, a batsman. So I would fix the designated hitter. I'm just going to um, leave that alone. I'm not going to touch it. I'm going <laughs> to, I will keep it in the interview. I'm not going to, I'm tempted just to delete it, but I'll let it go. Go ahead. What's, well, you're a great American. That's why. What's, what's the other um, and the rule, the other rule that I would change is the sort of, you know, or I don't, again, I don't quite know how to, the, the problem that I would change is the sort of shack problem, you know, hack a shack which is what happens at the end of basketball games where there's, you know, you're just, people are sent in to sort of uh, commit fouls on really poor foul shooters. And in such a way that it just drags the game down. It is, it's, it's meant to leverage a, you know, I guess a weakness. And that's a perfectly valuable, a valid um, exploitation of a weak skill on part of some, players, the fact that they can't seem to shoot free throws nearly as well as they shoot other things, other kinds of shots. But there's something about the way that rule plays out where people are constantly being sent in, you know, uh, lesser players who they don't, who the coach doesn't care if they fall out and the game gets, you know, these last two minutes of games are often just, you know, stretch out forever and feel like it's almost a different sport. So um, two so ways. I, would, I would go ahead. Sorry. I would figure out how to change that. I, I've heard lots of different strategies, but it's they're, they all have weaknesses to them, so I don't well, quite know. There's, um, there's two obvious ways. One, of course, which you're going to love is you could have a designated foul shooter for a person who's fouled a certain number of times if up to the discretion of the team. But that would go against your other rules, so we're going to leave that one alone. I guess the second would be that if a particular player had a certain number of fouls against uh, – he was fouled a certain number of times that the consequences could be different than just a foul shot. Uh, right. Would, they could maintain possession. Maintain it could possession, be more than, more than right. more foul shots. Um, it uh, could also be that there's some aspect of how many times somebody is fouled within a particular time frame or how many times somebody commits a foul within a particular time frame, because we know in basketball that the average person does not commit multiple fouls in a minute. Right. Yep. And so th there's, there's probably ways to deal with it. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if there's uh if there's a um, some sort of you know there's if, if there's movement on that rule change, um, yeah, yeah, it's, over it's, the next it's, couple of years. What about you? I'm curious. Very, You're a, well, you know, I think um, you know, listeners don't know Gary as well as I do, but Gary's one of the great question askers of all time. You see, this is the second time he's put put himself in the interviewer's chair very effectively. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no it's great. It's awesome. Um, I'd have to say it's interesting. You know, there's certain. I was reading an article by Bill James, who I'd love to have as a guest on Econ Talk sometime. I can't get a hold of him, but if anybody knows him, please let him know I'm interested. But Bill James, who I have a lot of respect for, recently wrote an article which just kind of shocked me that his his suggested rule change, if he could change one thing, would be to get rid of the balk, B-A-L-K, the balk in baseball. And I thought, well, that's a weird thing. They hardly ever have any. But, of course, the reason we hardly ever have any is that it's – you avoid it and – the whole idea – he has a lovely essay I'll put a link up to where he explains the consequences of the balk rule and slowing down baseball and you know you can't deceive the, the runner. Of course, we allow that kind of deception constantly in other areas of sports and even in baseball. It just um, – that was a very creative and interesting idea. Uh, I don't know what else I'd, I'd care about. Uh, I guess I'd maybe make the 
DH mandatory the national? No, no I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> let's uh, let's move to some of the. Um, well, I want to say one more thing about uh, rules, and then I want to come to some of the aspects of the book that I want to make sure we talk about. But uh, this week, or week and a half or so, uh, Bryce Harper of the Washington Nationals uh, had, was had a controversial statement or interview about that baseball's too stodgy. It needs to exp- people need to be able to express themselves more. We're a boring sport. People should be able to break the so-called unwritten rules. One of those unwritten rules is that after you hit a home run, you don't flip your bat. Uh, of course, that rule gets broken now and then, and as a result, sometimes the player who breaks it gets the ball thrown at his head. Um, what are your thoughts on Bryce Harper's uh, response to the unwritten rules of baseball, and what do you think about unwritten rules generally? We've talked about some already, but... Um, unwritten rules are kind of like the manners and mores of society, so there's these are mini societies, so they, they have their kind of understandings of what you do and don't do, and I think they're, I, I think they're always interesting. We did we did special issues on them and at the magazine or, or packages about them. Um, and I think for the most part, they kind of have an intuitive logic to them. Some of them, of course, you know, some of the unwritten rules, you know, were bad for society and they got fixed, but, um, but it's funny, you know, the, the, I think the argument for show, you know, against showboating in baseball is analogous to the argument uh, in defense of fighting in hockey. That's the right. argument in defense of fighting in <laughs> hockey has always been that, um, you know, you've got a lot of very strong, very big men moving quickly, uh, you know, with their adrenaline and testosterone flowing. And, and if you don't sharp, give them an outlet... And a lot of sharp objects in their hands. And a lot of sharp and objects. And if you don't feet. give them an outlet, uh, then they will behave with consequences that could be serious, if not deadly. The... The, the lie is put to that theory by European hockey <laughs> yeah. in which they don't have uh, fighting and people are not stabbing each other with sticks or slicing off people's hands and fingers. Now, there will be people in America who will say, you know, the last thing we want to be is like Europe. And um, <laughs> but, you know, I- I- irrespective of those kinds of nationalistic or cultural biases, I think that's a little bit BS, right? That whole idea that you need fighting because yeah. it's a it's a pressure well, we, steam valve. We did an episode on so it. So I we think did the an episode on it. We'll put a link up to it, which an author and, and a guest made a case for that. But um, carry on. Um, so I think in baseball, as I understand it, one of the arguments against showboating is that you know some percentage of pitchers, if you show if you show them up by hitting a home run, as if the hitting yeah. of the home run was <laughs> not itself a you know showing up their yeah. their lack of skill. Um, and you know, they are armed with a projectile that they, that they can throw upwards of 90 or a hundred miles per hour. And that can kill very much can kill people. Somebody has died in yep. baseball in, in a game. Um, and that, you know, there's a margin of error such that you want to sort of figure out how to keep things relatively calm so that the baseball doesn't become a weapon. It just makes no sense to me because again, like these are, um, grown men, um, who should be able to regulate their, um, you know, their, their anger. And I think, um, you know, a code's a code. So uh, you you're, if Bryce Harper wants to, you know, stomp around the bases, Jeff Leonard, you, you know, some, some players historically figured out ways to basically do something that didn't look like grandstanding, Jeff Leonard of the Giants was one of many players who figured out a way to do something that looked very subtle, but that was actually like basically uh, his form of grandstanding such that it really used to anger people on the other team. Leonard, when he hit home home run, would sort of like run around the bases with like an arm kind of cocked halfway down, like a (laughs) half of a flap of a bird. But it was specifically meant to be the equivalent of I am running around the bases you know, acting like a crazy man. I'm just doing it in a way that um, is, you know, doesn't look like I'm doing it. And so, you know, nobody was, you know, people didn't like him and I'm sure he had balls thrown at him, but nobody was, you know, tried to kill him. And so I think that this is just, you know, a lot of this, the baseball rules are have to do with culture and I, um, and have to do with, I think they got reinforced more. They get reinforced because I think there's a perception that different people from different cultures will, celebrate in different ways. And there's probably some longstanding, I don't want to, you know, get into too much of this stuff, but there's probably some longstanding ideas about 
how baseball, which is this American sport that was historically played been in a whites only league was supposed to be played. And we want to sort of keep it that way. And I think there's still vestigial kind of biases against celebration that come from that. Yeah. But these things kind of have to be worked out by the individual players, right? I don't think you can legislate this kind of stuff. And I think like if Bryce Harper wants to do that, then he should, then he should start celebrating more, to be honest with you. Yeah, I suspect he will. And he gets, yeah. he gets to celebrate a lot. He's a really and these, you know, and, it, and these things will, these things will, will, will change over time if there's enough of a, uh, if there's enough of a, um, you know, impetus from underneath, right? I mean, Tiger Woods celebrated in a way that was just so much different than almost every other uh, golfer before him. First of all, he was just more, not only was he more passionate, but he was more coordinated. <laughs> like when you would see, you know, Tom Watson dancing around a green after sinking a putt, it just looked embarrassing to all human beings as great of a golfer as he was. And Tiger was just sort of much more coordinated in his impassioned kind of fist bumps and things like that. And in the beginning there was a, li- you know, this was golf, remember, but yep. people got over it. Yeah, and they, they understood that it was not about anything other than Tiger Woods being happy that he did something great, not that he was trying to show up anybody else. And so there's a way in which you can – right? the NFL doesn't mind celebration. The NFL minds taunting. And th- it's been pretty good in the NFL. It's, they've, they've figured out a way to, to sort of you know, navigate that, that sort of fine line, and I think that should be one in baseball too. There's a way to celebrate that's not saying I beat you. There's a way to celebrate that says I did something great. And I think that's where we – you know, some sports are just slower than others to sort of have that understanding permeate the entire um, – group of people that are playing. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think just as a, to close it out on this, I, you know, when, when David Ortiz would come around third and, and enjoy pure joy, throw his helmet into the, into the dirt or the crowd or the stands, wherever he tossed it to meet his play, his teammates at home plate. Um, it's a beautiful thing if you're a Red Sox fan, uh, but he never pointed at the other team's pitcher or mocked him or, and it was a it was a beautiful it was expression of joy and I think that's what we celebrate in sports and I agree with you 100 percent if it's not taunting I think it's it makes the, and it's it almost, makes it sweeter and it's almost always uh, easily discernible what somebody's doing right I mean I I know that from my own athletic pursuits I know it from watching my friends and watching professional sports like 95 percent of the time you know whether or not somebody's celebrating or taunting and I do think by the way that taunting is actually something to remove because again, if, if the idea of sports is an analogy or a metaphor for how, you know, we should be as individuals and how societies or communities should work, there's something very meritorious in the idea. It's fine to celebrate and to even crow or signal dominance with one's own greatness, but it's another thing and not a healthy thing to make other people feel bad about their weakness or their loss, right? Even in war, we have an entire kind of set of rules written or unwritten about how, you know, what losers are supposed to do or how we're supposed to treat people who lose, you know, prisoners of war, et cetera. Like we have decided that there's, you know, that we can have victory celebrations in liberated cities, but we don't murder our POWs or we, we, we're meant not to be, you know, just because they're weak and we've captured them. And there's, you know, there's a spectrum of, of all different kinds of things that are, that are about that. And so there's no reason sports can't have that nuance, um, you know, brought into these kinds of things, I think. No, and I think it reminds me, uh, as we think about taunting versus celebrating that, you know, sports is almost always a zero-sum game, and uh, a recent listener, I apologize, I can't remember the listener's name, but point, asked me the question, I think it was on Twitter, uh, whether our ideas of economic competition have been poisoned by sports competition. So in sports competition, for every winner, there has to be a loser. Uh, it's not always true in economics. Uh, both people can gain from trade, for example, often almost always do. Not necessarily both countries gain, every person within every country, as we've been talking about recently on here. But I think we, to some extent, import our ideas probably about competition from sports to other areas because it's so vivid in sports. And so you know, when you celebrate, it's there has to be a sad person. I find that you know that we, one of the things that I find so powerful about the NCAA tournament is that it is one and out, the basketball tournament. And so there's a lot at stake. 
and you know an incredible play that wins a game creates a lot of unhappy people. There's no way to ignore that, and the the, the networks have figured that out. They the camera bounces back and forth between the uh, the joy of victory and the agony of defeat, and there's an incredible human spectacle there. It's a, it's a powerful thing, and it's inevitable in sports. It would be painful to add to, add to that uh, humiliation that comes from the victor to the loser. Yeah, I think you know I, it, the the sports as you know as metaphor is a great one, but it has its limits. Um, and you know, in 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 life, um, there's this sense of you know you th- there can be multiple winners, and in fact, we're striving for that. I think very a very small percentage of the humans on the earth want to do well and also want other people to do less well. Yeah. Um, but in, in oh. sports, you do want that. You know, in, in many situations, but again, first of all, the whole idea of sportsmanship is a recognition that this could be me on the other side, right? The Correct. Sportsmanship is essentially an unwritten Geneva convention. Yep. It's I'm going to behave to you when you're down because I want the same treatment on the other side. That that doesn't make me less likely to want to win. It just makes me, um, you know, more m- more able to kind of like go forward the next day or the next practice or whatever the case may be. But it, it's interesting because – you know, we in general, I think, with in, in the interconnected, hyper technological world we live in, everything gets um, heightened, and all of these, you know, the sort of you know winner takes all mentality that that sports does have, like only one person gets the trophy, is a um, gets heightened. I think. Yep. In well, in the pain of our loss. world today. Yeah, the pain of second place isn't isn't a great achievement. It's second. It's Nothing, unfortunately, in many, many sports, um, maybe almost every sport. Coming, the runner-up doesn't get – gets no glory. It's not a – you know, the owner tries to usually – or the, sometimes the announcer tries to say, yeah, they had a great season. They didn't win at all, but they had a great season. And most of the fans think, no, we lost. <laughs> it's over. It's astounding, right? You can, you can, you know, I, I think a lot about the 2011 World Series, um, the Cardinals and the uh, – Texas Rangers yep. and you know that that game was decided and basically the you know late innings of a of a couple of the last two games it's 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 impossible not to think that the Rangers had a phenomenal season and yet it's impossible not to think that it was one of the most painful seasons yep. for the players and the so, Rangers fans no comfort there I don't think um, yeah such is life um, we're going to switch gears dramatically I want you to talk about uh, because you can't help but noticing it as you read your book, uh, the role that the British Empire plays in sports today. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. You've uh, you um, when we were talking earlier, you asked me, um, or when we were doing our pre conversation, you asked me some of the what, what were some of the more interesting revelations for me about um, in, in researching the book. And the, uh, I should have known the British Empire thing beforehand, but you know, we w- in all the rules that we found that we identified, and most of them are agreed upon by historians. A couple of them we made our own calls about this. But none of them, with the exception of one, did we have to translate from any other language into English. All the original rules of sports, as most people agree on them, were written in English. And they were written in English because they were the product of either – they were either the product of British um, people inventing a sport or Americans who are, you know, the the – the uh, the offspring, children of British yeah. people, the offspring of British people inventing a sport. And what you realize when you look at um, – at the, the the second and third, depending on how you measure it, by participation or by fandom, whatever the case may be, but the second or third or fourth most popular sports in the world are cricket and field hockey, and these sports are incredibly popular because they are they're the most second or third most popular sports in the world because they are beloved in India and Pakistan and places like that, which were part of the Raj or part of the British colonialism. Because you know, as the British, you know, spread their Uh, might across the globe, they brought with them their recreational activities and those recreational activities were adopted by the locals and often uh, mastered by the locals to an even greater extent than the British soldiers or merchants or bureaucrats could boast. And um, they became, you know, phenomena in those countries because if you're popular in India, as I like to say, you're world popular. (laughs) Uh, and it's so interesting to me that the mo- the modern sports industrial M- complex kind of owes its origins to sort of British colonialism. And I never really realized that until I started to, sort of, you know, understand like, you know, ho- the, that field hockey, which I think of mostly as an Indian sport, 
in the subcontinent, and it has its origins in a in a uh, 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 the Teddington Hockey Club in in London. Um, and you start to realize that as you as you just look at the history of sports, just how much the the, the British uh, had an effect. Now, we are careful in the book to say it doesn't mean that people weren't kicking around pig bladders stuffed with grass in all parts of the uh, yeah. in all parts of the world. Uh, but the first people to sort of codify the rules of their pig bladder stuffed ball kicking game w- and spread it in a way that everybody else said, okay, yeah, this is the way the game should be played, were the British. Pig bladders, by the way, um, I learned something uh, in doing the sport that, that, you know, in resource constricted cultures, you basically used almost every single thing from a, a, a slaughtered animal. You know, the hides, the meat, the organs, et cetera. The one thing that basically there was no use for were the bladders. That's because they had – For whatever yeah, reason. I was going to say kishka, but that's intestines. Okay. Yeah, and, and the bladders, and you don't – they're not they're not really – but they're actually very good material that when dried can actually be basically balls. If they're, and so the, in most cultures, the bladders of certain animals were the ones who were originally kind of repurposed by – mostly idle children, sometimes soldiers, to sort of be the thing that they would throw or kick or play around. So that, so we, we, we kind of owe a, a debt of gratitude to, to animal bladders as well. But in all, you know, field hockey was invented in, in England, but it, it, certainly in South America and in Asia and in Africa, there were pastimes or idle, you know, time wasters that involved people hitting Rabbish, balls or things like things. balls with yeah. sticks. <laughs> yeah. But the British, because they were often setting up the bureaucracies in a lot of these countries, their games followed in the same way that most, you know, of the Indian rail system is a reflection of sort of the British ideas about how you, you know, the width of train tracks, the gauges of train tracks. So too, the, the, the sports that they now, you know, think of that they now dominate, you know, cricket and, you know, and field hockey are, are very much subcontinental sports yeah. from a dominance level. But for the most part, that, that's a reflection of, of British imperialism. Yeah, well, they gave the world, um, you know, legal systems, sports, political systems, but maybe sports is, I, I never knew about sports. I never thought about it. Yeah. It's fantastically interesting. Um, now, it, I have a pre-publication copy of the book. Uh, it's a beautiful book, even in pre-publication. There's a lot of beautiful pen and ink drawings. Uh, and one of the more entertaining ones, one of the nicer ones, uh, are of trophies. And it's shocking how many different sports have different trophies. Of course, you've seen them when you start to think about it. You've seen them on TV when they get presented. And you realize, oh, yeah, that's the that's what the World Cup winner looks like. And that's what the Baseball World Series winner looks like, et cetera. But probably the most famous trophy by name would be the Stanley Cup. Um, it's at least really, in America. Yep, yeah, at least in America. And it's um, in Canada for sure. sure. But but the there are a few things that are interesting about the Stanley Cup that I didn't know about. One thing I did know is that it's really big. I knew that. Uh, it's also, I think, doesn't every player on the winning team get to have it for a day? Is there? Yes. Every player on the winning team um, gets to take the, tr- the the cup for a day. In the old days, I think they would actually just give it to them and then they, you know, please bring it back tomorrow. Now you have it for a day, but you are accompanied by the, a steward for the <laughs> National Hockey League or for the Hockey Hall of Fame, actually. Like there's actually somebody who's with you. So you can't just take it uh, by yourself as far as I, as far as I understand. There's, al- there's always somebody who's with you. Um, and there's, they, but there's v- shockingly few rules about what you can do with it. People have baptized babies in the Stanley Cup. They've, you know, they drink out of it. They do all sorts of things in it. Um, and, you know, and it, and it has gone to, you know, obviously many places in rural Canada where, you know, people, some guy will have won the Stanley Cup and then bring it back to the pond rink where he grew up in red deer you know alberta it's it's extraordinary i've actually um it is a big trophy but it's not as big as it could be so the trophy basically has these sort of bands around it and each band is made up of so you know the the trophy narrows but the bottom band probably has 12 kind of rectangular pieces of metal that have the names of the players of a particular year that won the cup and etched on it uh, and the bands but as the as people um as the years move on, the bands are removed. So if you took the Stanley Cup right now, you wouldn't see the names of teams that won in the 20s. 
Like those are stored okay. in the Hockey Hall of Fame because you can't fit them all, you know, um, at this point on the cup. I but they about exist. That. They exist somewhere. There's like, there's an aspect of the cup that's kind of, um, you know, it's modular, if that, if that makes yeah. any sense. Um, but it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating trophy that when, when, I, when we were, when I was at ESPN, they, um, uh, they brought it to the magazine's offices and you would have, you know, these were pretty hardened, whatever that means, you know, sports journalists. Uh, and everybody was uh, crowding around it as if it was the cutest baby ever born <laughs> from Prince William and uh, Judy Garland. Like it was uh, you couldn't imagine the level of interest in this um, this trophy. And, you know, they let us touch it and lift it up. It's very heavy, like it's you know well, heavier than you would think. Yeah. And the I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, and the most fascinating thing about the Stanley Cup I, I, I don't, is the number of mistakes on it. Like, <laughs> routinely, like, the, the, the classic of this is Jacques Plant, who, um, who was, you know, arguably one of the five or ten best goaltenders of all time, and he was on um, cup-winning teams multiple times, and so his name was on there multiple times, but almost never the same name, Jack, <laughs> Jock, Jock. It's just hilarious, the, 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 the mistakes that are actually on the cup. There's something very... Um, humanizing about that fact, right? And I, I'm sure Plant didn't mind. Uh, I think they got it right at least once and he won multiple, <laughs> he, you know, he won multiple times, but it's quite amusing. It's a, it's a, uh, it's, it, it really is iconic. And if you're a sports fan and you just grow up kind of, you know, watching the Stanley Cup and that's one of the more emotional kind of, um, you know, the, the championship, the end of the championship run in hockey is just an emotional, the handshake and the carrying it around. It, it's just, uh, if you watch that as a kid or even as an adult, and then you get to be in the presence of that trophy, it's, it's pretty powerful. So I want to say two things in defense of hockey after I was tough on it earlier. The handshake is one of my favorite things in sports, coming back to this taunting and respect thing that we we touched on earlier, because I think... When you see that, and the only thing even close to it is in any other sport, for me, I'm sure there are some analogs, but the only thing that's close to it at the professional level is um, professional football. You will see players embrace and share words after a, a, a contest, and you see the mutual respect. But in hockey, it's very transparent. Um, people aren't wearing helmets. They're very, you know, it's just, it just, well, they are actually, but they're not hiding their faces as much as a football helmet does and, and the cameras on them only. And so you see everything. So I find that very beautiful, especially when the goalies embrace because goalie is such a lonely position. And as we've talked about earlier, so much rides on it and there's got to be an incredible camaraderie between two goalies. And you get, to, you get to see a little taste of that. That's one thing. The second thing is it's a gorgeous thing. There's really, again, nothing quite like it in any other sport where the players take turns skating around the rink with the holding the trophy aloft, the Stanley Cup. And I'm always thinking, you know, I couldn't even skate around the rink, <laughs> let alone carry a really heavy trophy. Has, has it ever been dropped during that, that? And you're exhausted. You've just gone through this brutal thing and you just told, you just told me it's heavy. Has anyone ever dropped it? Has anything bad ever happened to it when it was on vacation with those players? Not as far as, <laughs> not as, far as um not as far as we could find out. Uh, we, we found no record of it being dropped. It strikes me that it, it you know, it, it would, it would, it must have been. But um, there's no great stories like there are about like the World Cup. You know, the the trophy for the World Cup was stolen twice, um, and there there are other stories about other trophies. But but for the Stanley Cup, no. I, I would I would suggest to you, by the way, that you're right. I think it's the most powerful um, sort of you know kind of. Uh, loitering that happens ha happens after the Stanley Cup is won, but also um, in the World Cup and in, and now increasingly in other soccer championships, there's like that exchange of jerseys that the yep, players do true. that sort of feels also like a lot of just a sign of respect. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna want to remember this for the rest of my life. I want to you know uh, so everybody kind of giving each other um, you know uh, like sort of souvenirs. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. So that that's also kind of I think a, a beautiful tradition. It's probably you know it's easiest in in soccer than, in, than it would be in football. <laughs> you know, here are my shoulder pads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little trickier. Um, well, we're out of time, but is there anything you learned in writing this book that, that sticks out that's a favorite either fact or insight that we didn't talk about? Um, there's probably two. One that actually uh, made it into the book and one that didn't because it didn't sort of fit. The one that made it into the book was how much uh, tennis – owes 
its existence in modern form to the invention of the lawnmower. Yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, the sport of tennis or some similar sport had been played by European royalty indoors in courts um, in the, since the 1400s. But it was basically a sport that was not even known to commoners for the most part. And in the 1830s or 1840s, there was a patent for the lawnmower that sort of changed British backyards. It took, basically turned backyards into play areas. And there, the first game that became very popular was, a, was croquet. Um, it was popular for quite a while, but then basically in the 1860s and 1870s, the second generation of sort of young adults who were looking for things to do to socialize, you know, athletically, they grew bored, you know, millennials and millennials. They grew bored. Uh, they grew bored of croquet, and they basically stopped going to these clubs. And there was a a, a, a guy who knew about the game of tennis, the, that old game, and so he basically commercialized it, put it into a box set with like a diagram for the court and rackets and tennis balls and instructions and sold it like, you know, at department stores and it became a giant hit. And those rules in that box set are basically for the most part, the rules, you know, that launched modern tennis. And the interesting fact about that is that the, the proof that I'm telling the truth is that if you actually, you know, go to the, uh, the website for the most famous tennis tournament in the world, which is Wimbledon, it is played at the All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club. Oh, yeah. And in the old days, it used to be known as the All England Croquet and Lawn Tennis Club, actually. <laughs> um, and I just said that to sort of, I don't know, I found that just delightful. And the, 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 the fact that it didn't make it in because it didn't work into the way we structured the book, you know, we went through, we give a little bit of a history for each sport, and then we take the rules and we annotate them and kind of give them a Talmudic sort of treatment about like, these, what, this is what they meant back then, and this is how the rules evolved. But in um, John Thorne brings up, a, the great baseball historian uh, brings up this great fact, which is, um, I love this, which is, this is true about all gambling. That was definitely true about gambling having to do with Baseball, in the early days of baseball, gambling was a big deal as it was in the early days of cricket. People were often much more interested in the sport as a gambling vehicle than they were in just watching it. But there used to be these, uh, in the stands, there was like, the, all the gamblers would sit together in what was called a gambling pool, and they would make wagers about different at-bats or different outcomes, and eventually they, the powers that be in baseball kicked them out of uh, the stands and they would go hang out somewhere else together and send runners back and forth to the field. Uh, and where they hung out were billiards parlors, um, where lots of gamblers tended to hang out. And eventually those billiards parlors became known for the gambling pools that used to hang out there. And so they became known as pool parlors, which is why we call billiards pool. Just, you know, billiards be became known as pool because that's where gambling pools used to hang out. I for me, that was just uh, hilarious. I never knew that history. That's very cool. And I can't help yeah. but think of Trouble, 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 and the music man, Harold yes. Hill. Um, <laughs> and that that's, just, with, that, that's the beauty of you. <laughs> it starts with P and it rhymes with – anyway. Um, my guest today has been Gary Belsky. His book is On the Origins of Sports. Gary, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. My pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>